Okay, now they are going to remember that Hebrew word that I use, Shabbat. Blah, blah, blah. Who cares? I don't care. All right. Who cares? We have the freedom right here. You ain't no elitist king dictating my life and my conscience. That was the Catholic Church in the Dark Ages. Didn't you know that? You are defending Sunday given to you by the Roman Catholic Church. Didn't you read? They gave you Sunday. You defending it. You arguing against God's Sabbath and then you speaking against the Catholic Church. You're, you're out of your mind. Okay, friends, we are back. Somebody in the comments said, you need to hear the argument that this man is making against these various passages that are often used by Seventh-day Adventists to speak of the Sabbath. And he is using the Bible to debunk these arguments. And, and I said, it's only fair that we make another video of Dr. Gene Kim, where he is addressing what is wrong with the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And now in this particular part of the video, he's addressing the Sabbath. And I said, that's only fair to have a part two. Even though I had issues with him calling us the devil's people. So you don't think that the devil's people, if you don't, then the devil's people are gonna stomp on. Satan's people, side comment, cheap comment, cheap shot, somewhat disrespectful and insulting, but let's put all that aside. Let's hear the argument and be fair and respectful to what the man has to say. I'm going to let him talk. I'm going to let him finish. And when he's done, I'm going to show you how many flaws is in this. And again, very few people will catch this because he's an intelligent man. He's a wise man. He seems to know what he's talking about, but I'm going to show you friends. Like, there's so many things wrong here. We're going to debunk this. Link in the description below. Like and subscribe to the page. Click the bell icon for more. I want you to watch the entire thing if you want to, because it's worth listening to. I can listen to the entire thing. Maybe in the future, do an entire debunk of his video. It's going to take me about an hour or two, or even longer. I would say maybe two hours. If that's something you want me to do, please let me know. I will be more than willing to do this. But... um. But I'm going to address one particular part of the video today that has to do with Genesis chapter 2 about the Sabbath. It's only fair for us to listen to that. And I'm going to read it first, and then we're going to listen to his argument. So Genesis chapter 2, he's going to tell us why this passage cannot be used for the observance of the Sabbath. Now, thus saith the heavens and the earth, thus saith the, thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the hosts of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. So Dr. Gene Kem is going to tell us why this passage cannot be used for Sabbath keeping. Let's take a listen. Sometimes you sick and tired of hear, hearing me say simple because it doesn't look simple. But if you read the mm. passage, just study the scriptures, you'll realize how it's debunked. Let's start off with Genesis chapter 2, shall we? Genesis chapter 2, verse 2. Genesis chapter 2, verse 2. So what you need to do is that you need to study the scripture because if you just look at, if you just look at the scriptures that the devil shows you, obviously it looks convincing. But when you study for yourself and let the Holy Spirit show you, you'll realize how much of a lie Satan does put out on you and how much a liar he is. And it's a plain as a nose on your face lie. Okay, so let's start with Genesis chapter 2. We'll look at verses 2 through 3. Now, pay attention to this. It is true that if you look at verse 3, the Bible says that God sanctified the Sabbath day. But you got to realize this. Keep in mind this. Notice that God mentioned that at verses 1 through 2, uh, excuse me, verses 2 through 3, he mentioned that, but he never gave that command to Adam. Did you notice that? <laughs> so it's as if God himself did this. Why? Because God knows what he's going to do in the future. See that? By the way, this is a no-brainer if you really studied your Bible. 
Genesis, who's the author of Genesis? <laughs> See that? Why do you think Moses will mention that then? See, that's the reason why Moses will mention it, because why? He was the one responsible for giving the commandment to observe the Sabbath to the Jewish people. See that? But it was never directly commanded to God's people at Genesis. It wasn't. It was not. It just simply said that God honored and sanctified the Sabbath. That's it. It never said he told them to observe the Sabbath. See, they're not reading. Remember one of the key things with cults? They don't read the verse as it says. They automatically show you the verse, interpret it, and they fool you. You notice the way that I explained at the beginning was very persuasive, but Satan can be very persuasive with this serpent tongue like he did with Eve. But I sure fooled you because you weren't looking at the verse and reading it as it says. See that? That's Satan's trick. That is Satan's trick. By the way, here's another thing to think about. If they honestly believe that Adam was a Seventh-day Adventist. Oh, I'm going to worship God and honor God on the Sabbath day. Let's use our brain cells here. Do you think it was only Saturday that Adam honored and worshiped the Lord, or it was every day in the garden as he walked and talked with God? See that? Think about that. Why did God put the Sabbath law to begin with with Moses? Because they were all busy like a lot of us stupid Americans, and I'm going to say stupid Americans, amen. We're so busy here and there. Work, school, driving through traffic. I need to get the, uh, this thing needs to go faster with my cell phone, the computer, TV, and let's go drinking and sinning. And because of that ring around the rosy, God wants you to say, hey, it's about time you go to church. That's why it's good that you have church time and amen for that, because you finally, and a lot of you know that I'm right about this, if you've been in our church for a while, you know that by coming to this church, you forcibly set, it set aside your wicked, busy, hectic schedule and finally be able to take time to just be still and know that I am God. Amen. You get refreshed by fellowship. You grow more in knowledge with the Bible study. Singing, preaching, you get out into conviction, get some things right with God. Shamefully, we should be doing this daily, but let's be honest, we're all flesh, which is why it's best to set a day aside. That's why the Jews, they were so busy. That's why the Lord made them and gave them a day. That way they can set, set some time to observe God. Because they're not like Adam walking and talking with God every day. They weren't in the Garden of Eden like Adam. So they had to have a Sabbath day. Okay. Now, let's look at Genesis chapter 2, verse 2 through 3 again. Now, the thing that just <laughs> annoys me the most, and I criticize this very hard. Now, you know your pastor does this. Because he hates it when people try to act some kind of smart aleck when they're actually an amateur. But then they pretend they're smart, smarter than you, put you down, and deceive you. That's what ticks off your pastor the most. So you know that. That's why the Lord, he goes for the simple. He goes for the poor people. He goes to the prostitutes, the tax collectors, and sinners. He goes for them. Not to some educated snob, some fatted Pharisee. Okay, now they're going to, remember that Hebrew word that I use, Shabbat? Blah, blah, blah. Who cares? I don't care. All right? But let's do this. They're going to use that Hebrew verb Shabbat at Genesis chapter 2. So because Genesis chapter 2 mentions Shabbat, they will use this to prove, as I mentioned before, that this must mean then that we got to observe the Sabbath. So that's how they're going to argue. If you look at Genesis 2, 2 through 3, it never says Sabbath. It says seventh day, right? So they're going to automatically say the Hebrew verb, verb is Shabbat. So that means Sabbath. So notice Sabbath was mentioned at Genesis chapter 2, verses 2 through 3. That's how they get around this. Now, the simple answer to this is you don't know Hebrew, okay? So this is why I get really hard on Greek and Hebrew scholars and your pastor has no apology whatsoever. 
And James White can cry like a baby all he wants and accuse me of verbal abuse. I don't care. These people tick me off the most in fooling people who have a love for God's word and use Greek and Hebrew so that they can cloud where they're caught in their weak area and talk you down with Greek and Hebrew. I don't like that, period. You notice your pastor does not treat you like that in this church. He goes down to your level. Jesus went down to where the sinners were and worked with them. You know, you notice how he treated the Pharisees when he fellowshiped with them? He talked down on them. You know why? Because these people talk like snobs. Okay, now, uh, I'm going to quit ranting right here, but Shabbat, look. Okay, this is the key. I want you to always remember this whenever they use Greek and Hebrew on you. You pick up a Greek and Hebrew lexicon and you can even find it online. By the way, your pastor here debunked these Greek and Hebrew scholars mostly like 80% through online lexicons. Okay, so you can even pick that up online. Okay? Oh, you didn't know that, huh? You know, I see these scholars want to trample on you, trick you. So I want you people who don't know Hebrew and Greek, trample on them. Make these scholars look bad. Okay. You know what this word means? It means rested. Now look at Genesis 2, 2 through 3. Doesn't it say rested? Yes, it says. So what do you think the KJV translators is? They translated these words to rested. Shabbat, where they're trying to say Sabbath, is not a translation. That's a transliteration. Now, you notice the Jehovah Witnesses and Seventh-day Adventists, they all make this dumb little mistake. You notice that? Remember the Jehovah Witness argument? It's not hell, it's Hades. Well, hey, dummy, that's a transliteration. Translation is hell. Now, why do I keep calling them names? Because it infuriates me that these people fool you with Greek and Hebrew because you don't know Greek and Hebrew. That's what scholars do. Do you know why they pull up big words on you in terminologies and mention you're not a scientist like me? That's why you have no say to correct me. They do that so they can act elitist on you so that they can win an argument. They refuse to get to the truth of the matter and discuss it from there. They say, until you know like I do with this term and uh, with science, etc., then you can tell me what to do. No. Who cares? We have the freedom right here. You ain't no elitist king dictating my life and my conscience. That was the Catholic Church in the Dark Ages. Didn't you know that? The Catholic Church in the Dark Ages thought they can dictate the consciences of poor farmers and plowboys because they thought they know it all. Now today, scholars, they think they're so smart that they criticize the Dark Age scholars. You wicked blankety-blank you, man. You're no different from the Dark Age scholars. Mankind never learns their lesson. Give it a thousand years, I bet you a thousand years later, those scholars would be poking fun at today's scholars. Oh, yeah. These bunch of... Every, mankind did not change. Schola scholarship did not change from the B.C.s to today. It did not change. The common denominator they hold is man at his own wisdom at pride. Okay. Now... The thing is this, is that, by the way, here's a funny thing. It not only means rested, there are several translations. It also means to destroy. So I guess God destroyed the seventh day, right? Would that support the seventh day argument? No. So look at that. They're picking and choosing definitions. Another word is put an end to. So God put an end to the seventh day. Are we going to say that? <laughs> cause to fail. That's what it also means. So God caused the seventh day to fail. So when a seventh day event is acts all smart aleck on you with Hebrew, you can use this on them. Didn't you know Hebrew it actually means to destroy this, the seventh day? So this debunks your seventh day Adventist religion. Dead wrong. All right, let me explain to you why. The first mistakes we have right now is the fact he said the Sabbath was not commended to Adam. Uh, excuse me, verses 2 through 3, he mentioned that, but he never gave that command to Adam. Why is this wrong? Well, it's wrong on many accounts. Did God command Adam to obey his father and mother? 
Why do we do that? Oh, wait a minute. Did God command Adam not to worship images in the Garden of Eden? But why do we think, how do we know worshiping images is wrong? So if you're going to use the argument that because he wasn't commanded in the garden, therefore it is not to be followed, I ask you the questions, what about all the other commands that were not commanded in the Bible that we follow and understand? You are inconsistent. Yes, God didn't give a specific command to obeying the Sabbath, but by the example that he set, the commandment was in it. This is a very simple thing you find in the Bible, right? For example, when Jesus came to earth in Matthew chapter 4, he called his disciples. What did he say to them? What did Jesus say to them? In, in Matthew chapter 4, I believe it's verse 18. I'm, we're going to pull scriptures from my head. It says this, Jesus walking by the sea of Galilee saw two brethren, Simon and Peter and Andrew, his brother, casting their nets. What did he say to them? Follow me. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. So you know what a Christian is called to be? A disciple of Christ is called to do? We are called to follow after the example of Jesus. He never said he told them to observe the Sabbath. Does Jesus have to always tell you ver uh, uh, um, verbally, specifically the things to do in order for you to do it? Does he have to always give you a outright commandment? Why do we love our neighbor as ourselves? Why do we treat people with love and kindness? Why do we do ministry for others? Because we follow Jesus, even though he commands it, he doesn't always have to specifically say, do this or don't do that for you to do it. Just by him setting an example, that is the commandment. Now, that's one argument. He made the argument that Moses, having been the author of the book of Genesis, was making reference to the Sabbath because he was speaking to the Jews. Genesis? Who's the author of Genesis? <laughs> See that? That is a lie. You know why? Because this view that he just argued here is a denial of the inspiration of the Bible and also of the authority of, uh, uh, the authority of Scripture. Two things, inspiration just got attacked, the authority of scripture. Let me explain to you why this is such a dangerous view. Let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 3. For those of you who know, all scripture is given by whose inspiration? God's inspiration. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof. All scripture has been given for, for, from God's inspiration, which means God's breathe for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So, wait a minute. Are you saying Moses was not inspired by God? Oh, he was the one responsible for giving the commandment to observe the Sabbath to the Jewish people. Are you saying Moses wrote the book just because he wanted to speak to the Jewish people, only giving to them the Sabbath day? So now, how do you do with the argument? And that's already flawed because there's no such thing. What Moses did, what Moses wrote was under the inspiration of God and the authority of the word of God is applicable both to Jews and non-Jews. And let me explain to you another thing that is also significant and he overlooked it completely, completely missed it. Was the Sabbath in the Old Testament only given to Jewish people? Was Moses the only person in the Old Testament who spoke of the Sabbath day? He wasn't. Let me explain to you what I mean by that. Here is another point, principle that you need to understand. And again, men like this can deceive a lot of people, but you're not going to deceive me. Men like this can deceive a lot of people, but a lot of seven divinists can sweep right through this. We can look at this and say, brother, <laughs> we can read you like a book. Now, here is the thing. Um, you're not going to deceive the people of God. You might deceive those in your church who are not studying the Bible, but not God's people. Here is the thing. In Isaiah, how do you explain this passage, not written by Moses, <laughs> and he's making reference to what? Isaiah 56. And I want you to hear what is being said here. It says in Isaiah 56, 
Blessed is the man that doeth this. What is the man that doeth what? The son of man that layeth hold on it. So you need to hold on to something. What is that thing? The person who keeps the Sabbath from polluting it and keepeth his hand from doing any evil. The son of the stranger have joined himself to the Lord. So who are these people? Are they uh, uh, Hebrew? Are they, are they Israelites? Who are these people? They are the sons of the strangers. Who are these people? Anyone who are not of the Jewish faith. If you join yourself to the Lord, in other words, you become converted. You become part of the Judaism in the time. You become part of the Israelites. You trust in the God of Israel. What happens? The Lord have utterly separated the people from him. He says, let not the eunuch say, I am a dry tree. Even the eunuch, now there's a whole discussion about that. Jesus said, I'm welcoming them too. These people were castrated for different reasons, of course. But God says, listen, even them, there's hope for them. If they do this one thing, what is that one thing? For thus saith the Lord unto the eunuchs that keep my Sabbaths and choose the things that please me and take hold of my covenant. Wait a minute. I thought the old covenant was only with the Jewish people. Answer the question. No. If they keep, if they keep the Sabbath of the Old Testament, they are showing faith and confidence in the God of Israel. Therefore, they become partaker of the covenant that was made with the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Will he ever make reference of this passage? Mm -mm. But now, unto them I will give in mine house within my walls in a place and a name better than the sons of daughters, and I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. How do you like that, friends? Who will he do this to? The sons of the strangers that join themselves to the Lord to serve him, to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, everyone that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it and taketh hold of my covenant. How much more does God need to tell you? You wicked blankety blank you, man. That right there debunk, debunk the argument. He debunks the argument about Genesis chapter 2. It goes to show, listen, man, this is bigger than Moses. And this is why when you read in the Bible, when Jesus is talking, he says, beginning at Moses in Matthew 24, in all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself, showing that Moses is highly inspired. Just like every other book in the Bible is inspired by God. You should not try to use the scripture to overcome the scripture. He is doing away with the inspiration of the scripture and he's dumbing down the authority of the word of God because he's trying to avoid the keeping of the Sabbath. And unfortunately, friends, we got people listening to this thinking that this is sound doctrine. No, bro. And he, the, the, no, it's not the seven divinities that are wrong. You are wrong in your interpretation of scripture. Your hatred for the Sabbath is being magnified over the internet. And James White can cry like a baby all he wants and accuse me of verbal abuse. I don't care. And again, this idea that Genesis chapter two, now, now let's debunk this. There is no mention of the Sabbath here, right? And he says, he calls people stupid, a snob in all kinds of names, verbal abusive indeed. Yes, you are a, ver a verbal abusive. As a minister of the gospel, this is not how you preach the word of God. And I mean, no way saying, friends, I don't got my flaws and my errors, but if you standing on the pulpit talking about a group of people and you are verbally attacking them, inflammatory language, you lose a lot of credibility in the eyes of a lot of people, including me. You may be telling the truth, but when your attitude stinks, the truth stinks. Even if what you're saying might be reasonable, automatically you are disqualified because of the stinkiness in your attitude. Just saying. Let's go back to the text now. Let me put my feelings aside. Here is the thing. He said the word rested. It's not the Sabbath mentioned here. And he gave different interpretation and so on, which really doesn't, doesn't matter. Context is king. So what does that actually mean? The original meaning of the word, and he says, you don't know Hebrew. First of all, you don't need to know Hebrew, but words does matter. When you go to the word, it actually says Shabbat. I mean, look at it. 76, 70, 73. So when God rested, he really rested. And what it means, God Shabbat on that day. So the argument he was trying to make is debunked by the same text. 
So he's using the Bible to go against the Bible, but the Bible is saying something completely different than what he wants the Bible to say. So I want you people who don't know Hebrew and Greek, trample on them. Make these scholars look bad. What God did on that day, God Shabbat. The reason the seventh day of the week, listen carefully to what I'm telling you. The reason the seventh day of the week is the Sabbath of the Lord is because the Lord rested on that day. You see, let me explain it this way. When God invested his presence after the creation account on the seventh day of the week, and by the way, the weekly cycle only exists because of the seven-day Sabbath. There is no other reasons. When scientists study the, all the stuff, the, mu the month, they say, okay, we can see the moon, the year, we can see on this, we understand why the year is significant. But when they look at the seven-day cycle, they're like, what's the purpose of that? There's no purpose in the cosmos that explains the seven-day cycle. Well, the reason we have a seven-day cycle is because of the seventh-day Sabbath. Because God created the world in six days and rested the seventh day. And that's just a fact. Now, the reason why the seventh day is the Sabbath, it commem commemorates creation. And the reason why the seventh day is the Sabbath is because God himself rested on that day. In other words, God invested his presence within the segment of time on the seventh day of the week to commemorate creation. And then God says, I want you to join me. Let me see if I can give you another perspective. What God did on the seventh day, right? He created, listen carefully, it doesn't work. He created a temple in time. So instead of God created a building for worship, a building for where he can meet with his people. God says, I'm going to create a time like temple. And I want you to enter into that time, just like you would enter into a physical location. God says, I want you to enter into a time location. And I want you to spend time with me. That's the intent. You can't do that on Sunday because Sunday does not commemorate creation. Sunday is the, is the first day of the week. The first day of the week, God made light. You can't commemorate light. You can't celebrate light. <laughs> it was good, but it was not good enough. It was at the end of the creation week, which was day six, after God made Adam and Eve. Then he commemorated the Sabbath. Why? Because it was after everything ended. This is why Genesis tells us in Genesis 2, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished. So the work had to be finished before God could institute the Sabbath day. You can't do this on the end of the day of the week. And that's why you cannot substitute the Sabbath. You cannot do away with the Sabbath. If you believe God created the world, there has to be a Sabbath. If you believe the seven-day cycle is still true, there has to be a Sabbath. If you believe that God is God above all the earth, there has to be a Sabbath. And I always tell it like it is. Without the, you can't have one without the other, friends. Now, this is the thing that God did. So he created a temple in time for his people. This is why all around the world, it doesn't matter where you are, who you're from, what kind of time you're in. Once the Sabbath comes in, the people of God, Seventh-day Adventists, or any Sabbath keeper, they will just enter into the rest of the Lord because it's been set up. So now, one last thing I want to share with you. So the institution of the Sabbath had to be established by the presence of God being invested in that day. Just like what you find in Genesis chapter 2 about the wedding, right? God took the rib from the man, right? And he made a woman. What is the institution? Is the marriage institution. This is what evidence we, evidence we call this the twin institution, right? The, the, the Sabbath and the marriage, the marriage and the Sabbath. These are twins institution. And we believe once you attack one, the next one is about to be attacked. And just in case you don't know, the marriage has been attack, under attack for a long time in our society. And if they take down marriage, listen, the next thing in line is the Sabbath. And we've argued this for a long time. Now, go, let's go back to the point. Where does the word wedding appear here? It doesn't appear, but the principle is already here. So God gave the institution of marriage as well as the Sabbath, both in Genesis. So does God have to compel you and spell it out and give you specific command for you to believe him? No, no. He set the example. That's all you need. 
He set the example and that was good enough. Your wicked, busy, hectic schedule and finally be able to take time to just be still and know that I am God. Why did he do it because they were busy? No, it was more than just about being busy. Yes, being busy has something to do with it, but it's more than that. And the, and the one, thing, one thing he said, he said the Sabbath is about a coming to the Lord to worship. Yeah, the Sabbath has to do with worship, but the commandment doesn't just say to come to the Lord and worship. And this is a big mistake because you can worship God any day of the week. But remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. This is not just worship. Keeping a day holy, it tells you there are some work you cannot do. Do you need to give him your time, your attention, and your heart? Yeah, you need to go to a church building and worship. But if, what if a person doesn't go to church? Can they, they cannot keep the Sabbath? Yes, they can. It's time to come in a place and assemble together. Yes, a holy convocation is needed. But a person can stay home and still observe the Sabbath. Because it's a matter of the relationship with the man and the individual and God. It's a matter of the heart and the attention given to God, abstaining from physical labor, abstaining from all the distractions of this world. It's about turning the heart to Jesus for 24 hours. This is to be done on the seventh day of the week. We abstain from cooking, from buying and selling and all these different things, all these worldly things, and we give the heart to God. So you can do this in anywhere of the week. And this is, it's also good to go to a church building and worship the Lord. But the idea that the Sabbath is about going worship just like Sunday is, no, that's not the same thing. You can worship on Sunday if you want to. You can worship on Monday and Tuesday. But you cannot keep any one of those days holy. Only the seven-day Sabbath can be kept holy. Period. Ah, uh, preach! Because that's the only one that God made holy. So my friend here is having some issues, some serious issues, right? What I argue is that you cannot just say because the word Sabbath wasn't there, therefore, and the person doesn't know Hebrew, we don't have to know Hebrew, we just need to have common sense. You can't talk about the Sabbath and you cannot blame Moses for this because other, other writers spoke about this. And you cannot say God didn't command it. Well, he, he didn't command a lot of things that we follow and obey and believe. So that's another flawed argument as well. So Exodus, uh, Exodus chapter 3, verse 5. Look at this. When Moses came to God on the mountain to receive his mandate to go deliver Israel from the Egyptian bondage, God says, draw not nigh, neither put off thy shoes from off thy foot, for the place whereunto, whereon thou standeth is holy ground. I want you to think about that. Why was this particular place at the time considered to be holy? Why? Because the presence of God had been manifested there. That's why. Why is the seven-day Sabbath holy? Because the presence of God is in it. Is that simple? Is that simple? Every seventh day of the week, God had invested in presence just as in creation. It is a holy day. And God's people are commanded, as it is said in Hebrews chapter 4. And again, I'm using the Bible, friends. I'm not using some. And again, I agree with what he says, some of these scholars and everything, right? Snobs and so on. I don't like to call people names. I don't go with the name calls. And I think he is very disrespectful. But nevertheless. Now today's scholars, they think they're so smart that they criticize the Dark Age scholars. You wicked Blankety blank you, man. What he says is just, you don't need all this education. But remember that, he's the doctor. <laughs> he's, the, he's the one with a doctorate degree. And he's going after people who are scholars. And I'm saying, like, well, you're the one with a doctorate degree. And that's nothing wrong with having a doctorate degree. I'm saying, if you're a scholar and you're attacking other scholars, I'm thinking to myself, like, it's kind of contradiction here. You know what I'm saying? But anyway, let's move on. God commanded... The Sabbath to be a holy day, and there it is. And I'm I'm done. I'm, I'm done. I'm done preaching. And I think you you got my point. There remaineth a Shabbat to the people of God. The word here is Shabbat. So we are told that God entered into His rest after creation, seeing there remaineth that some must enter therein. They to whom it was first preached entered not because of unbelief. That was their problem. It wasn't mixed with faith, we are told, in the passage. So why did the Israelites didn't get it? It wasn't mixed with faith. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise. 
that God did rest on the seventh day from all his work. So God rested from all his works. We must also rest from our works. So the example, so the example is the command. God rested from all his works. Hebrews chapter four, verse four tells us that. In this place again, if they shall enter into my rest, seeing there remaineth that some must not enter therein, they to whom it was first preached entered not because of unbelief. Right? So he spoke about David and so on. Let's move on. If Jesus had given them rest, then will he not afterwards spoken of another day? But he did not. So Sunday doesn't fit in the description either. We are told in verse 10, for he that is entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works as God did from his. So God is making the connection here. If God rested, we must rest. But it must be mixed with faith. It's not a matter of, I'm keeping the Sabbath, that's, that's all I need. No, there needs to be a, a faith in Christ established along with Sabbath keeping. Because Sabbath keeping and faith in Jesus goes hand in hand. So that's what he's talking about here. Let us labor to therefore to enter into that rest. Lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. So what is God telling you? You enter into the rest just like I've, I've also rested. I've set the example for you from creation. You do the same. You see, friends... <sighs> Some of these men is what uh, Ezekiel speak about that. He speaks about them. I give them my Sabbath. And instead, they, they regard it as a polluted thing. They profane the Sabbath of the Lord. Yeah, Ezekiel speak about these type of ministers, unfortunately. Her priests have violated my laws, my law. They have profaned my only things. They've put no difference between the holy and the profane. Neither have shown difference between the clean and unclean. They have hate their eyes for my Sabbath and I'm profane among them. Who's the problem here? The priest. Who's the problem here? The priest. The priest. They are profaning God's Sabbath. They're making it look like it doesn't matter. What is the goal? To make the Sabbath look like another one of those days. It has no significance. There's no value to it. We are free to do as we want. God is okay. Things have changed. What are they doing? They are putting no difference between the clean and the unclean. They are profaning God's Sabbaths. And they all say, oh, we're doing, we're doing God's work. We're doing God's will. And then calls the people of God, the devil's children, Satan's children, calling them dummy, all kind of names, just because they refuse to go along with your false doctrine. We don't believe you. You are an apostate. You are a liar. You are a deceiver. We can see right through you. We don't wish evil on you, but we know what you're doing. We know exactly what you're doing. And I don't care what kind of doctor is behind your name. You're no different. These men are no different than the average priest that they speak about. They're no different. And again, he made, he made a comment about the Catholic Church. That was the Catholic Church in the Dark Ages, didn't you know that? The Catholic Church in the Dark Ages thought they can dictate the consciences of poor farmers and plowboys because they thought they know it all. Excuse me, you are defending Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> you are defending Sunday given to you by the Roman Catholic Church. Didn't you read? They gave you Sunday. You're defending it. You're arguing against God's Sabbath. And then you're speaking against the Catholic Church. You can't speak against the Catholic Church when you keep Sunday. Sunday is the child of the papacy. That's the gift from the Roman Catholic Church to the Protestant world. And as long as you're keeping Sunday, guess what? You have very little to say against the Catholic Church. Very little. Because you have the one thing that has given them power and authority in Christianity, Sunday worship. So as long as you have that, you can argue all you want. You're still doing the bidding of the Catholic Church. Anyway, <laughs> I'm done talking. <laughs> Share your thought and perspective with me. I want to hear from you. I smile. But God's children, God's Sabbath keepers, listen. Be bold. Be strong. Know what you believe. 
why you believe it, where it is found. Because these men, ooh, 2 Timothy 3 verse 13 says, evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. And this is what we are watching and observing at this time. Anyway, friends, thank you for listening. God bless you. Share your thought and perspective with me. I want to hear from you. Have a good one. Bye. Thank you.